Okay, let me introduce you here. Uh, well, welcome everybody to DEF CON 30's uh, Alt Space VR DEF CON group meeting. John Clay is from Trend Micro. He's uh, going to give us a presentation on cyber attack trends in 2022. John Clay has worked in the cybersecurity space for over 25 years and uses his industry experience to educate and share insights on threat research and intelligence to the public. He delivers webinars, writes blogs, and engages customers and the public on the state of cybersecurity around the world. An accomplished public speaker, John has delivered hundreds of speaking sessions globally. He focuses on the threat landscape and cyber criminal undergrounds, the attack life cycle, and the use of advanced detecting technologies in protecting against today's sophisticated threats. So thank you for being here, John, and take it away. Take it away. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this will be an interesting one because obviously we don't have slides. So I'll try to talk uh, through the details of, of what I wanted to go over today. But thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, hopefully we'll get these slides rolling here at some point. Um, but uh, let's let's talk a little bit about attack trends. Um, you know, uh, Trend Micro was one of the founding members of the Cybersecurity Tech Accord, which is a group of, a, of over 150 uh, organizations around the world. And, and we, we did a survey recently uh, around nation state threats and uh, challenges with nation state threats. And we asked a number of questions that I thought were going to be pertinent to this discussion today. Um, and I wanted to, to share some of those with you. So the first the first one is how concerned are you with being a victim in state attack? Um, you know, as we we've seen with the uh, Russia Ukraine conflict going on, there's a lot more talk about nation state activity. Uh, you may be in an industry that you may be targeted by nation state actors, but um, it was interesting. The responses went from very concerned, somewhat concerned, a bit concerned to not concerned at all. And only 2% said not concerned at all. So everybody is a little bit concerned about this and about nation state actors targeting them. Um, the next question was, how will we prepare to defend ourselves against these uh, nation state attacks? And one is increasing investment on cybersecurity related technical measures. So certainly looking at the technical aspect. Um, they also said improving training and education of employees. So we're looking at people and the people side of, of the uh, equation. And then, you know, designing a person uh, or designating a person or a team to be in charge of, of cybersecurity, establishing or enhancing corporate policies. So when you think about risk, right, we think about, we always talk about the uh, people process and technology. And, and the answers here definitely fought, fell in line with that, which is, you know, so as organizations start building better defenses in the future, you need to really think about that. All three of those areas in your business is how are you going to deal with people, how are you going to deal with process, and how are you going to deal with technology? Now, the, one of the interesting questions was we asked, where will people be attacked? Where do they think within their organization they're going to be attacked? Number one at 60% was, was the cloud environment. Certainly with the pandemic happening, a lot of organizations have, have done some newly investment in cloud architects, architecture. And uh, that definitely is going to be a cause. And the criminals know this. Um, and they also realize, the, the criminals realize that it's new to a lot of organizations. So they probably are making some mistakes. And it may be an area that is uh, not as easily defendable by an organization as, as some of the other areas that have been around much longer. Uh, number two at 47% was employee computers and laptops. Kind of no no. Uh, not surprising, obviously, um, they're going to target your employees, they're going to target, the, and obviously the devices that they're using. Um, another one was uh, um, mobile phones was at 22%. Uh, hardware infrastructure was actually three at 46, almost 47%, which is like your servers and stuff. So um, that was, I thought was an interesting. And then how will we be t t uh, attacked? Uh, they asked this question in two parts. They said, "What will what? How will we be attacked today, and how will we be attacked in five years?" What's interesting is is today they say um, sixty uh, or forty seven percent say uh, malware, uh, and then there is phishing and spear phishing. Third is ransomware, 
Fourth is the denial of service. Uh, fifth is SQL injection. And six is man in the middle. But five years from now, they they think number one will be ransomware. And obviously, we've seen ransomware in quite a bit uh, um, in the news quite a bit. And so these respondents really feel that ransomware is going to increase in the future rather than decrease. Um, the, next, the second one, though, is denial of service. So I think they're, they're thinking that these actors may be looking to um, uh, do a little bit more harm within organizations uh, uh, systems. Malware dropped to number three, and then we had phishing and, and, and spear phishing as number four. So that, that was just kind of give you some idea of um, based on some of your peers uh, responding to this survey, I thought would be a good idea to, to key up. Um, the next area I wanted to look at is the actors and their motivations. Now, a lot of you probably know who all the different types of actors are, but when I talk to a lot of uh, customers and, and people in the industry, one of the things I mention a lot is that you need to need to think about who could be targeting you. So when you're going to build a defense plan and strategy, you need to think about who are the most common actors that could be targeting you because obviously their motives and their methods may be different based on the different types of actors. So today, obviously, we have probably the number one is cyber criminals, financially motivated folks. Um, these are the ransomware gangs out there, uh, the business email compromise gangs. Uh, but you also, you have um, amateurs and script kiddies. We certainly still see the script kiddies out there. Although one of my, um, one of the guys that I work with who heads up our research, uh, one of the research communities inside Trend Micro was, was sharing with me the other day, we used to have this, this pyramid of, of uh, sophistication when it came to the actors. And at the bottom was the, the script kiddies. Uh, which were, you know, a lot, let, not very sophisticated. In the middle, you had some of the newer um, people not around. And then the very top was the nation state. We always thought nation state actors were going to be the most sophisticated. But if you think about it, you're a much better uh, person in your job today than you were when you first started. And we've seen a lot of these actors being in this industry for many, many years. So the sophistication level, and it's almost taken that, that um, pyramid and flipped it upside down so that uh, most of the uh, threat actors out there or are within the the actor gangs are very sophisticated, almost as sophisticated as as the nation state actors uh, are. So that is one of the challenges we feel is as happening in in uh, in the world today is that uh, they are getting much better at what they do. Um, Hacktivists still around. We saw an emergence of, of um, Anonymous with the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine and Anonymous people going after Russian networks. So certainly those the hacktivists and, and again, their motive may be a little different from obviously a cyber criminal, for example. Um, nation states, obviously, we mentioned that, but also competitive spies can be out there. Um, so when you're thinking about that defense and, and depending on the industry you're in, you want to think about who are these people that could be targeting me so that you have the ability to understand their TTPs and the way that they could be attacking you. Now the next area is motivation. So what motivates these threat actors? And, and I have four areas that I that I talk about a lot in this area. Um, was there a question? Okay. I just muted him. Um, yep. Yeah. Speed it up a bit. Oh, no. I was saying I just muted them. No worries. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, the first area is espionage. So again, you know, mostly like Chinese actors uh, tend to be uh, very prolific on the espionage stage. They're trying to steal intellectual property. Uh, if you're in the and if you're a manufacturer, for example, you've got your processes down to how do you manufacture your product, um, and they may look to steal that because they don't want to invest in the R and D that goes in, you know, into into that um, having to do that. So. Cyber um, espionage is pretty big. The second area is financial gain. That's probably the biggest. Again, I think this industry now is, is closing in on over a billion dollars in, in illegal um, uh, revenue coming from cyber crime. Uh, so it's definitely a huge business out there today. Um, and even could be multi-billions for all we know. They do not uh, put in W-2 forms to the IRS uh, when they make money. So uh, we don't really know how much money they're making, but it's certainly uh, probably extensive. 
The third area is is uh, disru- disruption or destruction uh, uh, attempts. So we and this is where you know, as we saw with the Russian Ukraine uh, conflict, we saw more destructive attacks. There were some wipers thrown out there very early on. Um, that tried to wipe systems versus uh, encrypting systems, for example, like the ransomware actors. If I wipe a system, it's it's not usable anymore. Whereas if I encrypt it, obviously, if I can get the key, I can get that system back up and running pretty quickly. Um, so disruptive and destruction attacks. And the fourth area, which a lot of people don't realize today, is an education motive. And we're seeing this happening more and more, especially in the critical infrastructure area, where you may have actors inside your critical infrastructure, but they aren't doing anything destructive. They aren't doing anything to to create financial gain. All they are doing is trying to learn how to access ICS or SCADA devices or or access an OT network. Um, so that they can figure out, can I do it? What can I do? We kind of saw this potentially with the um, Russian invasion of the Ukraine uh, uh, power plant years ago, where they probably did that as much for educating themselves on how to uh, get access to that network, how to bring down those systems. So these are these are a lot more stealthier type of of activities because again, they're gonna come in, they're gonna do stuff, and then they're gonna leave and, and wipe all of the traces of their attack. So uh, they're kind of different. So again, thinking of the motivation of these actors against your organization, depending again on what industry you're in, what products you produce, what services you produce, that kind of stuff. So I'll think about that as you're, as you're building that defense model. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight is the attack stages. So, um, you know, there's a there's a definite model that has been followed over the last several years of the uh, attack life cycle, and it all came out with with kind of the um, uh, cyber attack chain that Lockheed Martin has, has patented, um, uh, and it really f- starts with intelligence gathering. So they're gonna learn, before they even launch any type of an attack against your organization, they're gonna figure out who do they wanna target. Again, that's gonna be not only what who the victim is uh, and, and what their motivation is in, in, in attacking them, but also who in the organization do they wanna initially target. Um, so they'll go all this upfront uh, intelligence gathering to understand who, what, when, where, why, uh, how am I going to target them? So they'll have all of that information usually up front before they, they actually go into the second area, which is point of entry. So how do I initially access that, uh, this network and get, and and get into it? And we're seeing some new things I'll talk about in a few, in one of the future slides here. Um, but point of entry certainly is the next stage. The third stage is where they did establish a command and control infrastructure. They need this to continually keeping access to that compromised network. And this can come in many different forms, but there's always going to be typically a command and control infrastructure that they will they will establish inside the organization and, and into the and, and outward bound to to allow them to see that information and be and continue to have that access. And then the fourth stage is lateral movement. And this is something we're seeing even a lot of the ransomware attacks where um, they'll get in and they will then laterally move because obviously if I, if I compromise an employee's system to get access, usually that employee's computer is not going to have the, the information or the data or the, or what they want to achieve what the, in their motive and getting access to your network. It will then need to laterally move across the network to Two different areas. It could be your cloud infrastructure, could be your data centers, could be critical infrastructure, your OT network, whatever that might be. Um, the fifth area is that asset and data discovery. So again, if they're if they're an actor group that wants to steal data, they're going to look for your customer data, your intellectual property, your source code. They're going to again as part of that lateral movement process where they map your network out. They're going to learn where that those repositories are, and then and then they look again. How do I how do I access those? The sixth stage is what we call data exfiltration. So once I find data, I need to exfiltrate that out to uh, to their command and control infrastructure or to somewhere where they can get access to that data. And again, this is not going to be done through massive 
uploads to the uh, to the web. It's going to be done in bite size increments, so you don't see it very easily. It's going to be encrypted, obviously. It may utilize different channels. It could use you know a Dropbox channel if you use a Dropbox inside your account. It could use a um, uh, you know a, a a OneDrive. It could be an email with an attachment, whatever it might be. They're going to figure out a way to make it. Uh, uh, exfiltrate it without you realizing it. And there's actually a seventh stage, which um, a, a lot of people don't realize it, but that's it's called a maintenance stage. And the maintenance stage is where they will continue to stay in resident in the network, but they may not be as active. They may throw some, some uh, back doors on systems that they just let sit there. They don't, you know, they don't activate um, uh, they may ping the command and control infrastructure every month or every couple of months just to let them know that they still have access because they may want to sell that access at some point or utilize that access for another attack against that organization. So that's and that's you're going to see that regardless of is if whether it's a ransomware attack, whether it's a business email compromise attack, whether it's a uh, just a you know a data exfil type of, uh, of attack. That these stages are all going to be this very similar in in any attack that you're going to see uh, today. Now, one of the things that I, if I don't know if everybody reads the um, Verizon Data Breach Investigative Report um, that they publish every year, but it's a pretty good report if you're not reading it, because it does give you some very good information about how the attacks are happening. Um, and But back in 2019, they actually had a, a uh, an appendix that they that was written by the United States Secret Service. And I can and I continue to use this because it, it's still relevant today and it's very good information because what Secret Service had done is they had they had interviewed all these malicious actors that they had arrested over the years and some of the very big breaches and they asked them, how did you get access to these networks? And and one of the th there's three areas that they came they came out of these interviews with these hackers. The first thing they look for is human error. So how can I can I find somebody who makes a mistake, misconfigures an S3 bucket, misconfigures a, a, a open IP that gave gives me access to that network or to that device. So they look for people um, people making mistakes. Obviously, human error also when I send an email in and the, and the user clicks on a link that they, they probably shouldn't have. Um, so that human error thing. The second thing they look for is IT security complacency. And this is where you think about like not patching quickly, um, not configuring things, not, not doing uh, enabling some of the advanced detection technologies that you have access to. You just don't do it. Um, the third area they, that they look for were technical deficiencies. So do I, am I not running stuff that I should be running in certain areas of the network? You know, maybe the OT network has been traditionally hasn't had a lot of security running in it. Um, so it's deficient of security uh, controls. So they look for that. But the interesting thing was um, they, they mentioned that uh, and, and this was quoted in the in the article. It is when multiple TTPs are utilized in concert that cyber criminals are able to gain and maintain access to a computer network. So they're looking for not just one of these, but if they find two of them or two or three of them together, they almost absolutely know that they can get access to that network. And one of the actors actually talked about being in resident on a on a on a very large organization's network for over ten years, just following this model over and over and over. Well, some of the tactics that we're seeing today utilized by the malicious actors, um, I mentioned the extensive intelligence gathering before the attack. So that's certainly gonna continue to happen. Um, if you are publishing information out there on your about your network, if you're publishing information about the people, um, that's always gonna be helpful to these, these criminals. Um, Collaboration between groups is happening more and more. And this is a very concerning area that we've seen happening in the undergrounds. In the past, you used to have these groups in the underground and they'd be, they'd be uh, uh, you know, working to only with themselves. They'd only work to, um, together with uh, if they were an independent person. But even now we're starting to see, for example, access as a service gangs 
who whose only purpose in life is to I, is to figure out how to access a network, and then they will sell that access to another group. It could be a group that does um, that uses uh, Emotet and use it to to laterally move across the network, and then they will sell access to a ransomware gang who will ultimately do a ransomware attack. So this collaboration is happening much more often than we've seen in the past. Um, counter incident response is used extensively today. So they are obfuscating their malware. They're uh, they're cleaning up after themselves, erasing their tracks. I was talking to our um, our incident response manager just just this morning, and I was asking him, you know, what are the some of the things we're seeing? And um, for example, they are we're seeing now where they will deploy some malware on a device inside a compromised network, and that that malware gets detected. So, you know, good for the security product that's running on that endpoint. But what we are seeing now is that within a few hours or a couple of days, we see a variant of it popping up and running and being executed on those networks. So they're actually taking that that detection and and then, you know, recoding, refiguring it out on how to uh, bypass that that um, organization, uh, that security product. Um, So that's happening quite often. Uh, The attacks today are going to be across many of the different areas of your network. So as part of that that life cycle we're seeing today, as I said, the attacks aren't going to stop and end at the endpoint. So EDR, great technology, but it's only going to see a small piece of the overall attack that you're going to see against most organizations. There's going to be network access that and, and network traffic that they're going to be utilizing. Um, it's going to go into the cloud infrastructure. It's going to go into a data center. It's going to go. It's going to use the the email. It's going to use the web layer. All of these areas of your network could be utilized by these threat actors in the campaign against your organization. So. That's why we're starting to see more uh, organizations starting to adopt more of a platform approach, potentially, where the products are working together. In the past, obviously, we used the best of breed model um, that worked very well back in the day. But today, because those products are pretty siloed, they don't talk to each other, they don't give a lot of information, it's making it very hard for you, the defenders, to, to manage that and see the visibility of, of these campaigns. So you detect something on, on one endpoint, you may detect something on a server in a different area your network and not realizing that it's part of the same campaign. Today, we're starting to see technology innovations that are allowing you to see that and and identify that much more effectively. And then lastly, um, one of the other areas we're seeing today are what we call our supply chain attacks or island hopping, where they're actually utilizing your your software vendors who who, um, are regularly you know, have communications into your networks and they're using them to pop into those networks. Or you have a a small business who's a vendor of yours, like in the target attack years ago, where it was the HVAC uh, uh, vendor who had access to the network. And because they're a small business, they may not have as good a security controls as you and your bigger organization. And so they will use it to pivot or laterally move from that network into your network. So we're seeing more than that. Uh, obviously, Solar Winds was an example. Kaseya was an example of that. Um, we just saw one just recently uh, happening um, as well. So software supply chain attacks are, are going to be on the increase uh, more and more as we go through it. Now, this next slide I want to talk about, you can't see it, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what's what's going on here. Um, I've been discussing with our tech support organization over the last several years, you know, how are these customers or prospects that call us getting infected in the first place? So what's the root cause of an infection uh, that happens? And there's some commonalities that we are seeing today from organizations that are dealing with these um, these successful attacks. First is weak credentials. Um, so the, we, there's no question that the threat actors today are looking to compromise credentials uh, and accounts. If I can get the Active Directory account um, uh, administrative account, I have pretty much keys to the kingdom at that point. And we actually see this quite often where that account gets compromised 
And so the actors are going to go in, they're going to turn off, uh, they're going to stop the process, the security product running on the on the endpoint, that process, they'll turn it off because they can, they have that access, they have that um, those credentials. Um, so weak credentials is a big one. Um, email accounts, for example, um, business email compromise happens a lot because I'm able to compromise that CFO's email uh, account very easily because they're using a weak credential on it. Uh, and then I send emails from that account. Uh, into the organizations. I asked my finance person, hey, wire transfer a million bucks to this account. I need it today. Uh, by the way, don't call me because I'm in a meeting uh, to, to do the two-factor verification process. Second area, outdated and unpatched operating system or applications. We certainly no question that um, exploits are being used regularly, whether it's an end day exploit, which is a, a known ex, a known vulnerability with a patch or a zero day, uh, which is a unknown vulnerability that does not have a patch today. Those are being utilized quite often. Um, but certainly we see regularly customers like, oh, I thought I patched it or I hadn't patched it or 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 in other cases, it's um, it's an unsecured device that doesn't have the ability to get patched, uh, for example, or it has uh, it hasn't been patched in years, like on an OT network, for example. Um, so that's going to happen. Advanced detection technologies not being enabled. So this we see this often where customer actually has the de the, the um, technology available to them. They just didn't enable it. AI and, and machine learning are prime examples of this. Um, so you may be relying simply on signatures and you haven't enabled the behavior monitoring. You haven't enabled a machine learning engine to be able to analyze those that malware and, that, and specifically those variants of, of known malware that would be able to be detected by those newer technologies. So make sure you, you know, when you, um, uh, you have those enabled. Uh, another area is misconfigurations. We talked about that earlier, so we see this uh, quite often. Um, and then one thing I wanted to highlight is ransomware gets all the uh, all the hype today. It's certainly in the news quite often, and one of the reasons is because it is the most visible, most loud threat we've ever seen in the history of cybersecurity. It pops up on the screen and it says, hey, you're in fact, you know, you've been encrypted by Conti or by Lockbit or whoever it might be. So when you get ransomware, you know you got infected. The challenge that a lot of organizations have is, is maybe thinking that that's the, the only threat against them. Whereas the reality is that that actor group has probably been in the network for quite some time because ransomware is usually the last revenue option that they take because it is so visible. They they went, once they launch ransomware, they know the organization is going to know they're infected and they've got somebody resident in their network. So um, that's just be aware that if a ransomware gets popped up, the likelihood that other activities have have been happening is very very high. Now, the next area I wanted to just highlight is, is who they, some of the areas that we're seeing them target uh, um, as they do their attacks. So one area is, why am I gonna target credentials, right? Why am I looking for accounts out there? Uh, first and foremost, they're very trusted, right? Your, your AD account um, or your Exchange account, Office 365 administrator account, those are gonna be trusted. If I can compromise those, I probably, like I said, I have the king, keys to the kingdom. Um, it allows them to disguise their activity because, again, I'm, I'm acting as that person um, so I can disguise it. There are a ton, a ton of stolen credentials being sold in the underground today. So I can go and buy RDP to credentials that were stolen from previous hacks all day long in the underground. And I can use those. And again, if I don't have a, a, a very good um, credential um, update process happening in, in my account, the likelihood that I have an account still out there that has the same credentials being run. We also see, for example, I was asking um, my IR guy today, I said, do we ever see where they can compromise the Trend Micro Administrator account? And he says, it happens on occasion, but usually when they find that out, it's because they use the, the same account credentials that they use for their AD server. So they're sharing accounts, uh, credentials across multiple applications. And again, big no-no for, uh, for most people, but uh, it still happens. And again, weak credentials is, is big. 
Now, why am I going to target people? So again, people are probably the, the weakest link inside your organization, the employees. But why would they continue to want to target them? Well, first, it's, it's definitely easier than a technical attack. Um, I don't have to go and buy a zero day for $500,000. I can just you know, craft an email from, from after my intelligence gathering about this employee who likes, you know, for example, likes the NBA, I can craft an email that says, hey, check out this latest trade in the NBA. Click here, click, boom, uh, infected. Uh, difficult to detect and respond to. A lot of times these employees don't even realize they've been infected, so they aren't communicating it to you uh, in the um, in the SOC or into the uh, IT department. So you don't even realize that they're infected and they don't realize it either. Uh, people definitely give away way too much information and in, in social media. Uh, as I just previously mentioned, the NBA thing, um, they're going to give their likes, their dislikes, their hobbies, whatever it might be. So crafting socially engineered um, uh, content to them is very simple after doing a, a, a scan of, of social media accounts uh, of those people. And it's very low risk for high reward. Now, um, vulnerabilities, I talked about vulnerabilities before. Why are they targeting quite a bit? Um, you know, obviously new vulnerabilities happen every single day. I think the last patch Tuesday, uh, Microsoft disclosed over 140, uh, which was a record for them. Uh, and that's just one vendor. So you obviously have multiple applications and, and operating systems you're running in your organization. You're probably getting uh, updates every day from one of those or multiple of those. And so these criminals recognize that. Um, they actually monitor those patches as they come out and they look at them. We're seeing more and more one day vulnerabilities than, we're, than we've seen ever before, which is basically a vulnerability that's been exploited one day after the patch was released. Um, so that's certainly uh, a challenge because there's so much information out there being, being shared publicly. Even the proof of concept stuff out there is being shared quite often and they use that. Um, there's an exploit marketplace in the underground. So there's uh, there's um, selling and, and buying and selling of of Vulner of exploits of vulnerabilities. You can go in the underground and you can search for Exchange or Office 365 vulnerabilities. It'll pop up a number of exploits that, that are for sale uh, in that area. If I want one for uh, a business application, I just search for that and I can find it and, and buy it and use it. Uh, and then lastly, zero days. Um, we're seeing more and more zero days. If you didn't see uh, Google Project Zero last year, said there was, uh, I think there were 50 or 80 plus zero days used in active attacks last year, number highest ever seen. Um, and maybe the reason, uh, you know, I postulate that potentially it's because you're doing a very much better job today of protecting your networks from the traditional stuff. So you're blocking those, those end day vulnerabilities or exploits that are being used. Uh, so they have to move to zero days because they are unknown and they, and they actually still work. And then the last area I wanted to just highlight is why target external facing infrastructure. Um, so you all probably use Shodan or you heard of Shodan. Shodan is a tool that can be used by you or cyber criminals, for example, of, of scanning the internet for IP, open IPs. Uh, and it'll give you information about those IPs. It'll tell you, you know, uh, what, it, what it is, what ports are open, what services are open. Um, and so it's very easy to scan. And obviously that's the first thing that they're gonna look for uh, in, in an organization is what is what open IPs do the, does that organization have? I'm going to scan those IPs and do a, a scan on them to figure out, is there anything on there that I can target and utilize to get access to that device or that IP? Um, so that's going to happen. Misconfigurations, we talked about that. Those, they are all, all over the place. Um, there's exposed ports and services certainly all the time on these, on these devices um, that may have, should have been uh, shut. Down. And often it's forgotten infrastructure, for example. It's people, you know, we see again, we, when we talk to customers, they go, I didn't realize that IP was still uh, there, that device was still on the network. It should have been, you know, archived years ago, but it's still active and still there. So that's, that's kind of the main stuff that I had today to talk about in terms of um, what is happening, how is it happening uh, in the underground. The next uh, just a few minutes, I wanted to hide and give you some um, highlight and give you some recommendations uh, that I give customers and, and people out there on how to help you defend against these. Again, this is a great time right now to really look at your overall cybersecurity um, uh, strategy 
and and your plan and how you go about things um, because uh, like I mentioned before with all these different types of, of TTPs and attack scenarios um, maybe the the a, a traditional approach uh, to your cybersecurity may not be helping you today it may be actually hurting you more than it's helping so first area audit and inventory so attack surface management attack surface discovery is a, are terms that are being used quite often but they're actually um, pretty good uh, because as i said if you can't see it you don't know it's there how do you defend against it so having something that can do some more attack surface discovery for you um, can help you understand, you know, audit and, and, and inventory all of the devices that are on your network, both internal and external to understand that. Um, and then identify authorized and unauthorized devices and software, uh, make an audit of event and, and incident logs. So, you know, you're obviously logging a lot. Um, make sure you're looking at those logs and see, identifying. If you don't have the expertise, you don't have the uh, the manpower to be able to do that, that's where maybe look at a managed service uh, provider or managed service um, uh, option for you. And then configure and monitor. So manage hardware, software configurations. So we talked about misconfigurations. You may take this time right now to look at all your configurations. Have a call with your cybersecurity vendor or vendors and make sure that you have their best practices uh, guides. Make sure you have and configured their products properly to and given the best opportunity to detect the latest. Make sure you have the latest and greatest software uh, from them, uh, from those vendors and make sure it's working. Uh, grant admin privileges and access only when necessary to an employee. So again, that looking at who has access to your AD administrative accounts, who has access to your customer data and then only limit them to being able to access that at, at the right time and, and the right person having access. Uh, monitor network ports, protocols, services, uh, activate security configurations on network infrastructure devices. So, um, so again, a lot of this activity, network activity can help you identify if you're, uh, if you're compromised, that lateral movement is an area that you can do. Even a command and control infrastructure, as it pings outside to the command and control server or servers out there, you may be able to identify. Maybe that that infrastructure is was built in a in a region of the world where you don't have businesses and business. So then you could look at, oh, why are we why are we um, why do we have something uh, you know um, connecting to a server in in Zimbabwe or wherever it might be, and and then you could cut off that access. Another area is patch and update. We talk about that quite a bit, but one area is virtual patching. You may not even you may not think about virtual patching, but virtual patching actually allows you to virtually patch that vulnerability for a period of time until you actually can do the proper process and, and QA of the full patch. Um, a lot of times those patches aren't complete. So the virtual patch may have a more complete um, uh, ability to detect a, an exploit. Uh, in fact, Google Project Zero, of uh, uh, the, the 24 zero days that have been used in, in 2022, 12 of them were variants of, of earlier vulnerabilities that had been used in, in attacks before. So they're starting, even the criminals are starting to use variants of, of exploits that worked in the past um, because they, they work now uh, and they can get around the defenses. Uh, but virtual patching, look at that. Also, um, network IPS um, outside in and inside out, that can help um, you identify some of this stuff as well. Uh, protect and recover, certainly implement data protection, backup, recovery measures as ransomware is, you know, one of the big things for ransomware was, can you back up and recover very quickly from, a, from an encrypted uh, system that's encrypted? So that would be a good one as well. Um, Enable multi-factor authentication. Definitely got to be that in, especially with, uh, like I mentioned, those those big uh, act applications, those business critical applications, and any access to your critical data, your customer data, your source code data, your um, your IP data, et cetera. Secure and defend. A lot of times, you have, there's actually preventative measures. So EDR is great. So for and response, but there's a lot of technology today that can actually pre prevent these attacks. Look for early warning signs. If I see emotet detection in my in my network, 
that may be an, an indicator that there's a ransomware attack coming in the future. And that can inform you and maybe look at you to hardening some of the areas, especially if you know the actor group, because you could go to MITRE attack framework site look up that actor group that uses Emotet or uses Cobalt Strike, for example, and you can identify their TTPs of future uh, areas of what they could do inside your network. And then lastly, train and test um, your employees. Uh, train your employees, train your users. If you're doing a, a, a cloud infrastructure, make sure your cloud architects are fully trained in how to secure that cloud infrastructure. Um, maybe implement some of these technologies today that can identify when somebody misconfigures something and it can alert you or, or ping that person that, hey, maybe you shouldn't do that, make that configuration change because it's opening it up to attack at that point. So that's all I had today. Uh, I hope this was helpful. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to take those now. Thank you very much for the hand claps. I appreciate that. Well, I will I will sign off then. Everybody have a great rest of your conference. I hope it all goes well. And if you have any questions or anything, you can certainly reach out to me, um, John underscore Clay at trendmicro.com uh, or John L. Clay on Twitter, uh, J-O-N. I don't have an H there. So thanks, everybody. Have a great day and uh, stay safe and, and, and healthy. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, John. Thanks very much. Yeah, press the R key to. Uh, Which key? Drop the the Romeo key to drop the mic. Romeo. Romeo. <laughs> uh, R. Letter R. Romeo. Yeah. Yeah. On your keyboard, if you press R, it'll drop the mic. There we go. There you go. Thank you, John. That was excellent. Uh, thank you, John, for the excellent presentation. Uh, we're still working on the slide problem, by the way. It looks as if the service that they use for uh, allows us to project slides into the meeting space has gone down. We are contacting, uh, we have contacted and put in a trouble ticket to Altspace VR tech support, and we've got multiple people working on it. They're doing PCAPs to see if there's anything going on, like uh, some type of network problem, that sort of thing. But right now, it looks like the service is down. Now, in the meantime, uh, Hey, Giglio, you're, you need to mute your mic because we're getting your keyboards. <laughs> Thanks. The, um, uh, so we're working on that. Our next speaker will be here in about eight minutes. And uh, as soon as they're here, we'll introduce them.